Dr. John Mutunga, CEO of the Kenya National Federation of Agricultural Producers. Welcome to the JSO interview. Thank you very much. Our focus is still on the environment and for Kenyans of a certain generation, you represent the CEO of an institution that was once known as the Kenya National Farmers Union. Correct. To my mind, an agglomeration of small-scale farmers. I wish to read to you a section from the Jubilee Manifesto, and it says, since subsistence farming has failed in Kenya, we must start an agricultural revolution. Agriculture shall be an economic commercial enterprise that provides Kenyans with employment, not mere subsistence. You represent small-scale farmers. The government says small-scale farming is not the way forward. So you are, in effect, the CEO of a dying institution. Um, I don't think so, because um, if you look at where did the small-scale farming come from in this country, it started at the point where we took over land from the white settlers. And at this point in time, we had land buying companies, which therefore, and the land tenure system that basically allowed individuals to own land. That has gone on to land transfer to the younger generations and therefore subdivision. And most of the high potential land, which is about 16% of the country uh, landscape, uh, was basically occupied, has been occupied, with a few pockets remaining right now. Uh, the idea is that this land has been used for agricultural production as a smallholder. Uh, if smallholder has not worked in, that con in the context of subsistence, then it is possible for us to make smallholder work uh, by investment in agriculture. So you're what saying in effect it's yeah. too late to change, we must continue with what we have and what we have is small-scale farming, so small-scale farming forever. So you are in effect criticizing the government. I'm saying in effect that, uh, John, we need to look at who, what are we talking about here, smallholder? We're talking about more than 70% of the Kenyan population. So we are saying that 70% of the food producers, who are also 70% of the consumers of the food, have not been able to sustain the production systems to make it more economic, uh, I mean, uh, make, make it more of an economic activity. So the idea is that we need to put our efforts and investments into making smallholder an economic activity. Uh, we have a lot of inform I mean, research findings that clearly indicate that if Africa has to feed itself, then Africa has to focus on various modules of making smallholder uh, agriculture work. Why? Because most of the land, most of the productive land, which we can call Arab land, is occupied by, by, by smallholder farmers. So if most of the land is with the farmers, the land is a factor of production. It means that economic activity called farming cannot be done otherwise. We also do not have land scale, I mean, land scale uh, potential land right now. On the other hand, irrigation has not been taken up uh, by, by, by Kenya, by the agricultural system of Kenya. Sorry, as let's, a go, let's go back. Let's go back one. I'm, I'm going to ask you of the examples in mm -hmm. specific countries where yes. your model holds true yes. that small scale farming is king. Uh, small scale farming has worked in Malawi. What Malawian, Malawian government did was basically uh, invest in agriculture through, through uh, the, 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 the subsidy. Subsidy has also been tried out in Kenya under the National Accelerated Agricultural Input Access Program. Through this program, uh, it is documented that smallholder agriculture has been able to increase productivity by four times. Which economic activity do you quadruple the, the output if, if, if smallholder is, has really failed? Doctor, I think I'm it's still the going approach. Back to one thing. You are yeah. an expert. Yes. You are an agri environmentalist. Sure. Are you suggesting that when the Jubilee Coalition went about writing its manifesto, people such as yourself were not consulted? Uh, I would clearly say that we were not consulted when the manifesto was done, and uh, we would clearly have come up with, uh, with, with possibilities within the smallholder, because what we need to do as a country is look at how did the other countries move from smallholder to land scale. Uh, we would look at investment in agriculture and also look at organization of the producers. The government of Kenya since, it depend, since independence has never focused on organization of producers. I'm not talking about supporting farmers' organizations, no. I'm talking about putting farmers into serious cooperatives who, who can therefore uh, do agricultural uh, as an economic entity. So smallholder farmers will basically establish collection centers of the product, a marketing infrastructure will be set up, 
and all these products would end up, end up to the market. They would introduce the standards and quality required, and therefore, it would turn into an economic activity. It's possible to turn smallholder into a vibrant economic activity. But we start with one thing. First of all, let, let us get to know what is our potential as a country. Where, what, what can do best where? And therefore, it's on these areas. It's called land master planning. It has been lagging on for a very long time now in the, in the system. Once we do get to know exactly what can, we can produce where potentially, then it is possible for us to sensitize farmers in those areas to adopt that particular kind of production system or that kind of uh, a commodity. Doctor, you're offering people something that they don't know. You're saying sensitize them. Sensitize yeah. them seems to me a very fuzzy word. In yeah. what way are you going to sensitize me, who's been planting millet or sorghum, for generations? This is what my people produce. This is our local uh, food. Sensitize me in what way? It means educating people to realize the economic uh, potential that they have. The right. idea is to look at what is possible in a given area. In other words, what value chains can do best in a given area. And therefore, we interrogate these value chains and see what kind of constraints lie within these value chains and what opportunities exist so that, that we can therefore no, focus you, on you, investment you, into you're, this. You're talking as the expert. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying things. Yeah. How am I going to oblige my aunties to change what they've been growing yeah. for centuries on the expectation that they will make money from their produce? Once they've planted, for example, yeah. Uh, red pepper, which might be a wonderful thing on the stores of, sure. of supermarkets across the land. Sure. How are they going to get this the, red pepper to yeah. the supermarket? The, How are they going to get watermelon, which is a wonderful yeah, thing yeah, in Europe, yeah. to the supermarket? Yes. The demand is there, but yeah. the, the spirit is weak in a way because they, 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 there's no way of turning knowledge into action. I, I think going back to the manifesto, the language should be left alone, farmers left alone to practice subsistence agriculture has failed. Right. Then we come back and say, with government intervention, subsistence agriculture, I mean, uh, smallholder agriculture can be turned from subsistence into, an eco into a vibrant economic activity. And then we go back and say, we educate our farmers to realize the potential for alternative utilization of pieces of land where they are. Right. Another, okay. I have, a, I have a long day ahead of me in, yes. on my farm yes. in the village. Yeah. When are you going to come and educate me on a one-to-one -one basis? Are you going to set up a school? I'm talking about uh, putting these things into, into practice in a way that people can visualize as they watch us talking. Already the agricultural system is, is very much organized. We have ATC, agricultural training centers, all over the country. And the farmers only need to be told that your area has been zoned for potato production. And therefore, they need to go for agronomic uh, training on how to do potato the best. And therefore, we set up a collect collection centers for potatoes. We set up industries to process the potatoes. We do several things at once. One, we, we, we reduce the economies of, of, of operation, of production. We reduce the production cost. Secondly, we increase the returns to investment to the farmers. Thirdly, we create employment through the collection and the sorting, grading, cleaning, packaging, and transportation and also the processing aspect, we bring, we bring in agro processing, which is basically creating opportunities for jobs in the villages. And that's how we can absorb the job, I mean the, the populations who are looking for alternative employment opportunities. Right. And unless we create those at the village level, we may never be able to say that we can amalgamate because people will cling to land as the only source of livelihood. If you can show them alternatives, they will basically, those who are educated, will say, okay, I would rather do the industry. I'd right. rather do the product management, collection and grading and transportation. Right, Dr. Yeah. Arika, if, with, 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 with permission, yeah. may we turn to the word scandal? Yes. Again, we're looking in very uh, layman's terms, laywoman's terms, about this idea of the maize scandal. Yes. We're a maize growing country. Yes. How did it emerge? Forget politics, you're not okay. a politician. No, I'm not a politician. Uh, but I'm talking about policy. Yeah. How does it come about that the maize suddenly disappears and is sold to people thousands of miles away? How as, does that as, happen? As a country, at some point we liberalized our products. So everybody sells whatever they produce, whatever to whoever is a willing buyer, willing seller. Right. Now, so we're coming let me, back let to me, maize. Let me, let me repeat what you've just said to me. Yeah, yeah. We have a national policy in place yes. where if I grow food you are that, which could feed your family in your region, yes. I'm quite... Uh, you are not obligated. I'm within my rights to sell it to people in outer anyone. Mongolia if they offer me more to money. To anyone, to anyone. 
Surely that's, that's a that's mistake. That's a policy nexus. But surely that's a mistake. There is, there is African solutions to no African pro problems, African solutions to yeah. African problems. Yes. Dr. Tari, why have you not provided the solution for that problem? There have been attempts to try and provide a solution in terms of having strategic grain reserve. Uh, there, is a, there, is a, there, is, there, there is also the effort to try and transform the strategic grain reserve into strategic food reserve. When we go to the food reserve, we will not be talking of keeping maize, maize uh, wheat and others. We'll be talking of keeping even milk, even vegetables and fruits for, future, for feeding uh, uh, the, the population. The National Cereals and Produce Board was set up as a, as a grain management system, whereby we have land silos where there is maize being produced and even other smaller silos at the points of, uh, of consumption, which means it's a national network of grain distribution. But at the point of liberalization, there is no condition that the NCBB has been given to retain whatever they have, so which means they can sell up to, but leaving what is called the National Strategic Grain Reserve, which is about, uh, I think, 4 million uh, uh, metric, I mean, uh, 90 kilogram bags of maize, and so on and so forth. This was upgraded to 8 million, uh, I think, two years ago. Right. And I think there, is, uh, there are efforts to try and uh, open up the brackets to, to 